Step one. So we just said that we're from Google. That is true. Um, but, but this talk has many things that are opinions of ours. And the lawyer cat is here to remind everyone, don't tweet our bosses and be like, Google said, shut down production. And like, that's, not, that's not Google. Like, we have a book that we will try and share later. That is the official download from the site. These are just our opinions. Book's official, though. Caveat lector, right? Um, so here's the agenda. This is what we're going to talk about today. If this looks super boring, the coffee's still good out there, and I won't be offended. I gonna, don't think James will be offended. Just close our eyes. Feel free to uh, have more of the, the fruit that's out there as well. Um, one thing to point out also is if you're in this room, you know some stuff about reliability, and some of these things that we're going to talk about today are going to be like duh moments, like obviously. But we're trying to kind of give a lot of you folks some idea of how people who aren't in this room are thinking about reliability and thinking about SRE. So that way, when you go back to your enterprise, you can have a little empathy, and you can understand where they're coming from and why they're uh, giving you bad opinions. So uh, this, this is the goal of the talk, is to, to tell you what it's like um, out there, if you know what I mean. Uh, and to do that, that's why we sort of tag team in this space. So um, I only joined Google a few years ago, and my, my background is in, like, I'm, I'm the dinosaur of the group. Shout out to the Jelly team. So, you know, I have the small hands. Like, I, I've worked in a lot of banks, like enterprises, large places with lots of bureaucracy. Um, so, so I provide that view of, like, how we've done some of these things outside of the Google. That's right. And, and if, if he's the dinosaur, I'm the alien from the spaceship. Uh, I, I worked at Google for a very long time. Um, I didn't know how the real world, world works at all. Uh, then I left. I, I joined a, a, an actual company on Earth, uh, and I learned a lot about <laughs> how uh, you know, they don't have warp drives on these normal companies. Uh, in fact, you have to just build your own uh, everything. Uh, I learned how to uh, move to the cloud. That was, that was very uh, <laughs> enlightening. Uh, I came back to Google to help more companies do that. So the, the point here is that we have these two points of view kind of attacking the same subject matter. So we hope you find it useful. Um, so what are we really talking about here, James? So this is the, I guess, the meme slide of the agenda. So we, we do get a lot of conversations where people are like, can you just tell us now, like, just quickly what you're going to do? So you can, you can watch this and then get coffee. So you've got a second chance to escape. The good news is that enthusiasm for SRE is at a record high. This is a great time to be an SRE. Like, we found that people are almost universally enthusiastic about it. The adoption, not so much. There's a lot of challenges in this space. We talk to people a lot, and they're like, you say that reliability is the most important thing for me, but it's not, or not for all my services. And you need to consider that, right? That's different from how we originally put it in the books, and how originally we talked about SRE. And often people think it's expensive and or difficult. And actually, it often is. Like, that's actually something where we're like, it's not as easy as we thought. Like, it is actually surprisingly hard. And not everyone, it's going to come as a shock to some of you, wants the Google SRE way. But that's OK, because we've seen a lot of successful people doing SRE outside of Google. And that's why we want to share some of these things. I apologize for the pop-up. Clearly, I didn't. You can see my talk is happening right now. It looks like your talk is happening right now. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you all know. Thanks, computers. Um, so we actually care about it so much. We, we did write a book on it. We will uh, be handing these out, uh, assuming they arrive from UPS today. <laughs> Last minute delivery. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and if you find uh, you, you miss any part of this talk or it's the, the, the text is too small, uh, the book has text you can read. It, this, this whole talk derives from the book. So, and it's uh, a really thin book. It's also very thin. You can read very it on the plane thin. home. It's no problem. So uh, does anyone recognize the rest of these words? Yes, one or two. Uh, the point of this slide is just to show, uh, please, please, please do not buy some SRE and then shut down everything else. Like, Do not adopt SRE and say, like, now we don't need to DevOps anymore. Uh, bad plan. We've seen customers say, like, this is our plan, and we're like, please stop. This is not, this is not the way forward. Uh, specifically, things like ITIL, 
feel like they're the same as SRE to some folks, so they feel like they're just the new version of the thing. Uh, ITIL is a superset of what SRE does. Do not shut down ITIL because you got SRE. Sure, there's overlap, but you have to be thoughtful about it. You can't just you know, replace one with the other. You don't have to like these other things. Just, just don't try and replace them with SRE. That's, that's the key message. Um, often people do then say, like, I get it. Like, I see that, and I'm okay with the ITIL people, but they say you must have a cab, and I keep having problems with that. And even, even the Agile teams are like, you need to put all of your incidents in a two-week sprint. And we're like, incidents don't actually work in sprints, which is very confusing. So we know, like, we're not, we're, we're not hiding this. Like, we acknowledge that some of these items are not philosophically aligned with SRE. But we've seen more success when people tackle these by modifying the existing structures than trying to replace them. So every time someone says, let's get rid of our change board, if you haven't replaced it with anything or modified it, you didn't get rid of your change board. You just made a shadow change board that's doing stuff without you knowing. Don't do that. Like, modify your change board, modify your knock, like, change these things that you don't like into the things you do like instead of removing them. That structurelessness will be really problematic for you. <laughs> so so this is, it's not universally true, but like we do speak to some startups, and they're like, you know what? I don't see why everyone finds this so hard. And I'm like, so I borrowed this, this cartoon from someone. Um, Does this ring a bell to anyone? Anyone see themselves in this picture, perhaps? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> if you've been in the enterprise, You've tackled, I was one of the cloud architects at one point. I do like the architects. I was the sysadmin at yeah. one point, like I was a DBA. Um, it's really hard moving to cloud. And we often see a lot of people do the cloud migration at the same time as their SRE work. You have a cloud migration story and you have an SRE story. You do not need to tightly couple them. That, that will probably be bad. It's very hard to do SRE without cloud. Or like private cloud, you don't have to choose our cloud, like our cloud. But that's quite hard to do. So often people couple them together. But, but please think about doing them separately. Um, SREs can do cloud adoption. That's cool. But like, if you try and tie these journeys together, that's super hard. So maybe, maybe don't do that. That's probably a good lesson. Uh, who here has heard of Dora? This is the Google pitch, right? Uh, Dora is great. We like Dora. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's the DevOps Research Associates and Associates, something like that. Oh, sorry, assessment. It was associates at some point. Research assessment. Uh, so what we've done is we've uh, surveyed many, many companies. You may have uh, done the survey. If, if you have, thank you. Please, please do it again next year. Um, and we're, we're able to associate uh, capabilities that teams add to their sort of quiver of things they can do um, and what that has to do with their business outcomes. Um, and we're able to show some, uh, if not causality, at least some uh, interpretability, or we can, I think we call it prediction. So we can say that uh, certain capabilities together will predict certain outcomes. Uh, I'm not a PhD in statistics, so I can't tell you the difference between those two words, but I've been told it's important. Um, so the, the idea here is that uh, we're able to show that adopting things like DevOps is actually not just like a clever idea, it's actually a good idea for your business. Um, this goes over quite well with the uh, let's call them the non-technical uh, people in the room. Um, it, it helps if you can point out that if we do this, we will make more money. Uh, people seem to like that, so FYI. Uh, recently, we've added reliability to the list uh, in terms of uh, measurements that we can make about a company. Um, and I think specifically, we only look at availability right now. I think the, this room will, will kind of scoff at that and say it's more than availability, but uh, you know, you gotta start somewhere. It is though. <laughs> um, we like it so much, uh, we're starting to you know, blog about it and things like that. So uh, if people are saying, uh, you know, we have DevOps, why do we need SRE? Or we're getting SRE, we don't need DevOps. Like, point them at articles like this that say, uh, SRE actually just complements DevOps. We're actually being quite explicit about that. So we're hoping that will help people have uh, fewer annoying conversations. Uh, one more set of numbers. Uh, I guess there's going to be another one, too. Uh, we, we, we do have like an actual bit of data for you, which is if you're able to introduce uh, some form of reliability improvements to your company, uh, not only does it feel better and you feel like it's up and it's all nice, uh, you actually are able to achieve your organizational goals at, at 1.8x 
compared to companies who don't do this. This is a good number slide to send to like an executive or manager or person with a checkbook. Like, why should we do this? It's so we can do all the other things we want to do better, faster, more likely to succeed. Um, it's not just a good idea. The data says it's true. You can repeat this. You can be like Google says this. This, this is a real number. F feel free to take pictures of this number. This, this, this is from the Dora report. Um, so uh, when we say business goals, uh, think things like OKRs and you know, projects and things like that, but think also uh, revenue. Uh, think uh, employee retention. Uh, even stock prices um, are related to this number. So uh, these are real numbers. Uh, so the, the, the real uh, awesome situation you can get to when it comes to uh, SRE and DevOps is if you can deliver software effectively, that's essentially the crux of DevOps, how to get the idea out of your brain into production. And then you can take the thing that's in production and make sure it stays there and it's happy. If you can do both of those together, you get to do some vector math and things go up and to the right. See what we did there? Arrows, pretty cool. Um, this is where that 1.8, yeah, up, I think up and to the right is the good one, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, so so we, we've, we've shown this to uh, lots of, again, uh, non-technical folks, and it helps them get it. So take, feel free take to this, take this, run with it. Give it to your executive team. They're like, why are you doing SRE again? It seems really expensive. Two arrows. You have to do these things. Do, do these things together. It's not the DevOps or the SRE. Combine these together, you will get better business outcomes. So here's the bit we didn't talk about. Here's the, and this is actually from um, a person called Ron Westrom, um, but it's highly used in the DevOps space. And it talks about culture, but in a very specific, meaningful way. All the bits that we talked about there, and then the stuff that we put in the original SRE book was, was all the sort of technical and financial and all the tangible bits. But the bit I think we've started to discover over the last few years is, None of this really works without good culture. And we'll, we'll talk about this a few times. And we don't mean culture like in a nebulous way. These specific things are what we think makes SRE possible. And every time we've tried to do SRE without at least taking into account these factors, you don't need to do everything. But the more up and to the right you are, the better off you will be in the SRE journey. I think we hoped that we would have like the magic software that we could sell or the perfect sort of you know, deck that we could give people. But actually, what it turned out was if you try and do more of these generative culture things, your SRE will get better. And, and that those things will, will then feed on each other. If you don't do these things, maybe stop and have a think and, and retarget some of these items. Yeah, and we want to point out that uh, the, the line at the top is an opinion. So we think that SRE is emergent from culture. Uh, specifically, like in, in my experience, the, the Google culture from whatever years ago uh, produced SRE. Like, I don't think that was like a mistake. I think it happened because the culture was what it was, and we were facing the challenges that we had. But you didn't um, know. It's like the water with we the didn't fish. Know, yeah, it was the water and the fish. Thank you, Andrew. That was, that was a perfect. Uh, Perfect callback. Good one, James. We, we're going to have several callbacks today. It'll be, it'll be great. Try to, try to count them all. Hints and tips? I mean, sometimes people are like, that sounds great. Culture, cool. OK, what specifically are you recommending? Uh, and we align with the Dora folks on this. Like, the things we've seen work do tend to be, the DevOps things and the SRE things do tend to align pretty well. If you're doing communities of practice, this is fantastic. Um, if you do training centers, and I'm so sorry, if someone's like, I work for a training center, this is very rude. We don't mean you shouldn't train people. That's not what we mean by no training centers. What we mean is you should learn by doing, like SREs learn best by doing, like having that capability. And sometimes people do things like dojos in the DevOps space to do those sort of real life or mimic real life capabilities. That's where you get better learning when you have real incidents, when you have shadowing. Like, those on-the-job things are a lot better. You can still do classroom training, come to conferences. Like, those things are still OK, but do more on-the-job training for SREs. That seems to be a much better space. We say, with SRE, you should do things continuously and gradually and build things. And then often we see SRE programs where they're like, I get it, but this time we're going to do a giant three-year roadmap for SRE adoption. That hasn't gone well. Like, very few places have done really good top-down, big bang SRE adoption. So maybe think about doing more of the 
communities of practice and grassroots, and be careful. Just, you can do them, like centers of excellence. We, we don't say don't do it, but like maybe think of it as an enablement function and not like an ivory tower. Yeah, uh, one of the principles of SRE is gradual change. Uh, make sure that also applies to SRE itself. Uh, don't try to just shove it onto everyone and tell them exactly what to do. It, it won't work. All right. <laughs> Fresh callbacks. Here we go. So for the jelly folks, Triceratops? Is that, no? Dinosaur that joke. Good. Dinosaur, no? A little bit. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of small text, but like you get, you get the gist of it, right? <laughs> And this, I, this is obviously mine as well. Um, you may not have heard of it, but you can Google it. There's something called the Red Queen effect, um, where change occurs um, around you as much as like, your, your attempts to change yourself. Right? So you, you often have to run just to keep up. And a lot of times people are like, I don't understand why I'm having to do the DevSec ML ops, or why am I doing SRE now? We did DevOps last year. The, the reason why I think SRE is becoming, we, we think, <laughs> the reason why we think SRE is becoming more popular is because the environment is changing around us. We have increasing adoption of cloud, we have increasing scale and internet facing capabilities for our companies. And the more that that happens around us, the more we have to adjust and adopt. So we don't think that you need to do SRE as a sort of independent thing, we think you must do SRE in many organizations because of what's happening around us. And, and although we slightly mock it a little bit, that's the reason why DevOps is constantly evolving. It's constantly trying to cope with the pace of change, and we're just trying to adopt and adapt to that. OK, so uh, this is the interactive part of the session, just to make sure everyone's awake. Uh, Here's a question. Can you build a 4.9 service on top of 3.9's infrastructure? I expect there will hands. be. So, hands. Yes or no? Yes, hands up. All right. No hands up. This, this is standard. I get exactly 50 50 on this. Um, I would say the answer is yes. In fact, I'm, I'm fairly sure of it. Very um, sure. I, I'm 100% sure of it. 99.999% sure of it. So, the point here is, is you can definitely build more reliable things out of less reliable things. Like, this is how the internet works, right? So this is why we have things like TCP. Uh, the best way to think about this is RAID. So on this virtual stage, but probably in a different country in 2019, uh, my friend Yaniv Aknin gave a really great talk called The SRE I Aspire to Be. Uh, it was awesome. You should totally watch it. But in that, he basically shows the same idea where he uses the example of RAID, where he says, you can take these disks that break all the time, you can add some something to it. In this case, it's a trade-off of buying more disks, paying twice as much for the disk, adding a bit of complexity in terms of software. And what do you get out of it? You get a disk service which doesn't fail as often as disks fail, which is a simple idea. But really, you're having, let's think of it as a 2.9 set of infrastructure, which is these disks that fail, and you're getting a 3 or 4.9 like disk service instead. So take this model and apply it recursively to your systems. And, and this is like the core of distributed systems, right? We can have small amounts of failure, and we can make up for it by making trade-offs, whether it's in time, money, space, things like this. So this is, this is resilience engineering, reliability engineering, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is the core of what we're doing here. So uh, this leads us to a very abstract model. I apologize. Uh, this is strangely one of the best models I've given to enterprise companies who don't quite get it. Um, I expect this will make perfect sense to many people in this room. When I show this to companies, either they tell me I'm wrong, or they already get it, or their heads explode. Right? It's one of those three. And so what's going on here is the traditional model, we call it uh, component reliability, is to have a very strong This is like the base. dinosaur side. Yeah. yeah so, so the dinosaur, James, will present himself as the dinosaur. Um, you have a very strong base. And what's important here is that the resilience of the entire system inherits from that small or from that large, strong base. Right? It's not additive, generally, in terms of adding re resilience and reliability as you go up the stack. The new model is the base must be more cost effective, because I'm afraid it's much, 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 much bigger. Also, we want to change it quite often, right? The problem with a 
locked room covered in cement with many plugs going into it is you don't want to open the door and you don't want to add things to it because you want to leave it alone, you want it to be stable. In cloud, we want to be able to change it all the time. We want to be adding racks and racks and racks and racks and racks because we have all these customers. So what we have to do instead is expect the base to be more narrow and we need to instead build reliability on top of it in software. So the system needs to be like RAID. It needs to be improved as you go up the stack. This is potentially weird. If this is weird to you, do not feel bad. <laughs> like, this is just a different way of working and thinking. And I've found that if I just present this slide to enterprises, the conversations that we have as a cloud company go much better. They kind of start to get it more. Unless they are, we're already getting it, in which case we're fine. So it's a bit of a trick question, because the answer is both. <laughs> you, you can, on the left-hand side, you have to make the mainframes more resilient. They are very resilient, the mainframes. That's fine. They do go. If you do the thing on the left, you cannot build more reliable services on top. Like, that's how it's designed. But if you do the thing on the right, and most SREs do the thing on the right, it, it, it's not the same. And here's the best bit. You can do either. Like, you don't have to listen to us. But please don't cross the streams. Don't try and do both at the same time. Don't try and scale out on these very reliable servers. And, and like make that mess of the two. So like pick one for your service or application and do that. If you're running on cloud, it shows you. It's yeah. on the right. You're already on the right. I'm sorry. You just didn't realize it yet. So just be aware that if you're running on cloud, you picked the right-hand side. Um, and, and there may be some cloud providers. Us. We can provide some services that will try and mitigate that, but like that's what's happening under the hood. Uh, another like kind of example story here is like if you if you are on the right because you're on cloud and you're not really getting it yet, you will come to someone like me and say like why can't you just keep your VMs running more often? Like we've had our VMs running for ages back here and they never turn off, but yours turn off sometimes. And we're like pyramid, like sorry bro, like this is how this works. So uh, just be aware of this, right? And so follow on. When should you be doing SRA in this space? When should you go back to the, the monolith? <laughs> like, like you, you don't have to do every one of these things. You shouldn't do SRE for every service. That's another whole thing that we keep reminding people, I guess. But maybe have a think about these things as good check marks for when you really need to do like higher level services and, and adopt SRE. Is it a natural product differentiator? We often ask people, is reliability the most important thing in your product? And they're like, no. And I'm like, maybe SRE isn't for you right now. Do you really need this service up? If the answer is no, we'll get to it on Monday, have a think about whether you should hire a load of SREs. If you have hyperscale services, SRE chose you. Like if you have a million cores, you, you're kind of committed. So that's slightly different, but it's the same thing. Like you'll know when you have too many users or too many cores, and you'll suddenly need to be doing these things. So do stop and think about whether you're applying SRE too widely. And maybe don't think about like more abstract SLO things. Think about like these really basic core principles. And then I think the second one is like when. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, next one's good. Next one's okay. good. So often people are like, look, I, I've got my startup and I, I need to start with a load of SREs. And I'm like, okay, I mean, maybe. But actually, you probably want to think about SRE when you have, just on the previous slide, those critical factors. It, something needs to be incredibly reliable, and that will always take priority. And this isn't our model. This is a, a, a McKinsey one that I, we haven't quoted. I guess maybe it's in the book. It's in the book. So have a think about your product market fit. Speak to your PMs. Understand where you are. If you have an error budget, and they're like, really, we're going to ignore it, whatever the error budget is, you don't have an error budget. So you know, if, if reliability isn't the most important thing, and in emerging products, it rarely is. Like, unless you are a reliability startup, I guess, probably right. one exception. So have a think about when you're going to do SRE, as well as why you're going to do SRE. Cost. And there's another one. A lot of times people are like, I think SRE should save us money. And I'm like, yes, you are correct. And that is why Google does it. We do it to save money. We do not want to have to hire millions of SREs to go and manually do things in data centers. It is not as much fun as you think. So. We absolutely think SRE will save you money. The crucial bit, please take this away, it will do it on a global level for your company and not a local level for your team. 
This is crucial when it comes to funding models, when it comes to management, all of the surrounding pieces. Every time you fix something with SRE, you fix it for the company, you don't fix it just for your service. And that makes your funding model almost as important as everything else you do. So really stop and think about how you do cost reduction in SRE is at scale. It's by rem you know, removing global problems. And if you try and fund it locally, this will be bad. If, if SRE is in IT and IT is a cost center, you're going to have a hard time, right? You need to have the scope of the entire company at, in, in your head when you're, when you're looking at the cost savings. OK, uh, this is my favorite slide of all time. Uh, please take this extremely to heart. Uh, thank you, Spider-Man. Uh, please don't do this. How should we start? We should start small. Ah, OK. I, I know we keep saying it, but, but we're going to say it again. Please start small. Start, start with a single team. Start with a single service. Try and get good at that service, and then, and then spread out. Gradual change is amazing. Every time we've seen people try and do 100 services at once, it's been really unnecessarily hard. So please start small. Um, also, uh, invest in your people, please. Uh, please don't fire all of the ops who can't code. Uh, I'm speaking to the managers in the room and the execs that are watching this maybe later on a video cut up for them. It's tempting. Um, it's tempting. Like, it seems like a good idea. Oh, S3s are coders. Therefore, let's just get rid of all these people and start over. Like, bad plan. We have seen it in real life. It does not work. It does not, it does not work. It does not work. Um, so instead, yeah, it turns out you can train people, right? If someone understands your business, uh, you can train them up. Uh, if you find that you're training people and some folks are just not willing to be trained, not interested in being trained, and you have a role that requires them to do something else, sure, that person probably isn't fit for that role eventually. They, they could be moved elsewhere in the company. Maybe you do have to part ways, but do not just take the stance of, we're cutting the entire org and we're starting over. This, this is a bad plan. Uh, again, gradual change. Try to transition the people that you have into the roles that you want them to do. Best SREs are the current people who are in that role. That's right. Um, we say, you know, embrace risk. It was, I think, the second chapter, third chapter, something like that. Um, so reliability is inherently complex. It is impossible to plan for it in advance. Um, there is a, a, a terrible story that James tells about uh, companies who, uh, every time you ask them if they had took any risks that have failed, they say, no, everything that we do succeeds. That's a bad story, right? You don't want everything that you try to be successful. Uh, expect there to be failed programs. If you're not having that, that means you're not really trying hard enough. And what you're really probably doing is you're not even accepting programs that have a chance to fail, right? And this is not part of a generative culture. In fact, this is one of the other less good cultures. If you're telling people that they can only take successful risks, you're not doing the thing you think you're doing. And I think the crucial bit is the risk is accepting you. Like, it's there in production. Like, it's happening. So, you know, be cognizant that you can take safe risks first and, and reward your teams for doing it. Reward your teams for, like, those failures. Because if you don't, like, the risk will happen anyway. That's right. Well, this is a good one. So we've done some work to try and, and merge some of the DORA and, and SRE pieces. Um, and then this is, what, I think, one of the interesting things that came out of that. So on the right-hand side, and this is from an old uh, said DevOps report, um, the J-curve. Like, people have talked about the J-curve before. Like, J-curve is real. It's an actual thing. The first time you do something, it, it's probably worse. Like, when you do something new, it's probably worse than you were doing before. Like, that's the J-curve. Like, it's a real thing. So what we found, though, with, with SRE, like, that actually is the case, right? Like, why would that be different? Why would SRE be unique in not succumbing to the J-curve? But it has a, another sort of slightly darker consequence here as well, where people think that the adoption of SRE will result in linear improvements. And this is the chart on the left. So you can get the report. like You can look at it in more detail. But what we're trying to say to you, basically, is you will get the majority of your SRE benefits at the end of the journey as you've got better at SRE rather than a linear improvement. And we don't like that. We were hoping that you would get linear improvements. So you did a little bit of SRE, you get a little bit more reliable, a little bit more, a little bit more. No, it'll be kind of the same until you get quite good at it. And then you'll see the sharp uptick. So the best, the elite performers in this space outperform dramatically. 
Don't give up is the story. Don't be like, well, that sounds hard, so I'll just stay in this bit at the bottom. Do not do that. Just, just accept and warn your teams, actually, until you get quite good at this, you may not see as much benefit as you think, but it is there. It is there at the end of that curve. We've this, seen it. This, this is a, a, a hard pill to swallow, and this is also like a warning to leadership. Uh, you know, we, we need to uh, start on this journey. We need to stay with it for a while. Um, even if the indicators don't tell us that it's working along the way. Uh, they may a bit, but we found that the, the actual benefit is going to be, you know, later. Um, so think of uh, the Ulysses Pact for all of you uh, classics majors out there. Uh, when uh, Odysseus said, you know, tie me to the mast and, and like, let's make it through the, the, the sirens, uh, they, he had good sailors. They stuck to the plan, right? And they, get, they made it up the other side. So if they had gotten halfway through and listened to Odysseus say, cut me down, cut me down, then uh, it would not have been um, you know, the same outcome. So they were able to stick to it because they knew what was coming, right? They were, they were, able, they were warned ahead of time, and uh, they accepted that. They, they moved on. So, Got to throw a little classics in there, sorry. Haha. <laughs> And I think we, we're trying this in time for questions, so I'll try and come through a little bit. Like, let's just give some, I think, practical bits as well. Right? So we've had some theory in this space, but let's talk about a few things that seem obvious to us sometimes, but like, we've seen things happen. So you know, if someone's, like, often people are like, wow, prod is broken, and that's not a really good SRE thing. Wow, do I have some darker stories for you. My laptop is broken. SRE, you should be fixing this. Now, we've all got, like, some part of our family who's like, well, you work in IT, you can fix my laptop, right? Like, that, that's, that's bad at home, but like, I get it, they're your family. That's worse at work. When it gets to the point that someone collars you and says, my printer is broken, this is really bad. If your SRE team, real life story, if your SRE team ends up in a situation they're fixing printers, it's gone horribly wrong. So like, be prepared that the, the, the darkness is like more common and deeper than you think. So, Really do not think about smearing SRE across all of your DevOps teams and prod support. Like, you will end up like this, and it will be really, really bad. So like, refocus on, like, hey, we do this very specific thing in SRE. Or, like, we do not do just general stuff. Like, refocus in that space. We can leave these up, and you can take pictures. They're in the book as well in terms of specific things you can do. Uh, much of this is already in the SRE books as well, too. Yeah. But we should probably push forward a little bit. Um, Platform's a good thing. Platform is like a hip, hip word right now, and I'm hoping to get on that train. Um, so the way that we think about platforms is through the lens of capabilities. We think that you should be adding capabilities to your organization by means of building a platform. So that platform might be uh, all kinds of tools you have built or bought. It might be activities that you do as a group. You're already, you're already living in the platform. It is the water that you're swimming in today. So if you think I don't have a platform, yes, you do. Uh, if you push code to production in any way at all, you have a platform already. You're just not really calling it that. You may not be planning it that way. So uh, here's kind of a visual guide to building a platform. Uh, over time, you're going to be adding capabilities. You're going to be writing tools. You're going to be introducing pipelines. You're going to be you know, adding things like you know, canary releases, each of these is a capability that you can add to your platform. Uh, over time, you just get more and more of these. Separate that from the concept of transitioning services onto that platform, especially if you're building like a new next-gen platform, right? Uh, decouple the idea of building the platform from adopting services onto that platform and treat those services as customers. So a new customer who is highly, uh, you know, has high requirements should be able to talk to you about what they expect from your platform. Um, what you want to be able to do is gain confidence in your platform and the capabilities that you have in it over time to the point where, you know, the credit card processing service or the, the thing that makes money uh, is comfortable coming onto your platform. This is, this is the winning move here. Uh, the beauty of this is that when you adopt that service onto the platform, they gain all of the capabilities all at once, right? So this is the, the rising tide lifting all boats. The bad plan is to do that too early. Don't build a new platform, and before you really have very many capabilities, say, this is the new hotness, everyone come move over here, let's put the credit cards on the new thing before we have confidence in it. Bad plan, we have seen it done, doesn't work. Um, here, so okay, here we, here we have the fun uh, one. This is a fun one as well, right? So here's another one. 
Um, unrelated to platforms, but like a very important topic. We've never seen a chief reliability officer, so that's a made up word. I mean, all words are made up, but like we made that up. So what we found, though, is that the companies that have a chief reliability officer, whatever you want to call them, a VP of SRE, like some kind of executive who's really interested in reliability, that's been disproportionately associated with the success of SRE. So we wanted it to be all grassroots and cool stuff, but what we found was if you do not have executive sponsorship, your SRE can only go so far. There is a grass ceiling in this space. Now, obviously, there can be exceptions, but that's the general rule that we keep finding in this space. Often, they don't know it. Often, we're like, who's the chief reliability officer? Oh, no, we don't have one. I'm like, but who's this guy? Oh, he's the VP of SRE, and he, he can block anything. Like, he's really in control of things. You have one. But if you don't have one, you should find one. And when they abandon reliability, whether they leave the company or they change roles, that's when we see SRE fail disproportionately as well. So just be super cognizant that you need an executive sponsor in this space. Every time we have an argument about this, I stop and I'm like, do you have a CISO? And people are like, of course I have a CISO. Or like, I'm a startup, what are you doing? But mainly, of course I have a CISO. If you have a CISO, it's because you think security is very important. And therefore you have an executive person who looks after it. If you think reliability is important, have a think about you should have maybe a reliability executive. If you don't, maybe reliability isn't important to you. Maybe. Uh, how do we know if it's working? Uh, we actually don't have a good metric for all of reliability. We do have the MTTL. Nine. No. Ah. Sorry. <laughs> there is uh, uh, availability, right? This one works okay. Uh, it, is, it is a start. It is a proxy metric. We don't really have a good sense of my system is so good that I'm robust and resilient to outages that I would have had otherwise. It's very hard to measure that. If you have ideas about this, please come tell me. Um, but you can use some other metrics as well, like are you enforcing consequences on SLO breaches? Uh, are you still you know, praising the heroes within your organization? Uh, maybe, maybe don't do that. Um, are you uh, funding every time you have an outage? Do you say, oh, maybe we should fund the SRE team more? Also a bad plan. Um, and of course, are we celebrating success? Um, we should probably push through. We've got a couple of minutes, so let's, let's uh, do it. Another so. callback, right? This is real. We saw the, we saw the curve. Like we, all, we all saw the curve. Like, you want to get across the chasm, right? Turns out. <laughs> the chasm is a lot wider than you think. Everyone, everyone here is in the innovator at early, early adopter space, right? Like, that's, you're at the conference, right? You're the innovators. You're the early adopters. Be prepared for the rest of the organization to be much, much further across the chasm than you. I, I don't want this to sound bad, but just be aware. Right? Yeah. But you can fix it. You can do it. Um, we talked about the generative culture before. Like, you should have the culture off to the right. Here's how you do it. This comes from Project Oxygen, I believe. Aristotle. Aristotle. They were similar programs. Uh, here's how you get there. Don't just buy ping pong tables, right? Build psychological safety, dependability, structure, meaning impact will come. This is how you get a generative culture. Uh, there is much, much more on the, the rework site. Uh, I won't get into it, but click on the link when you, when you get this later. Um, always make sure you're striving for sublinear scaling. Uh, I want to point out, uh, don't make SRE a silo. This, this goes against the plan. I see it a lot. It just shouldn't be its own silo. Uh, and finally, uh, make sure that compensation is considered, right? SREs are engineers. Uh, it's very easy for an organization to label SREs as SREs, but treat them as like a lower class. Uh, please do not do that. Not only is it like not cool to like my friends, but also it just doesn't work for the business. So, you know, maybe that's a good reason for you. You're struggling to hire SREs. Money is surprisingly effective. Yeah, we keep hiring these SREs and they, they don't stick around. They don't do what we expect them to do. Oh, huh, it's weird. What are you right. paying them? Huh. Last. Uh, one, one final tease. Uh, we are building a thing that we're calling a map. This is called the reliability map. The idea is we're having a lot of customer conversations where we, they say, How do, like, you know, we'd like to talk to you about SRE, and they think it's a small thing. It turns out it's a huge thing, and we need to have a way to understand how far have they already gotten. Uh, so we built this crazy thing. It's on a, I apologize for the name, r9y.dev. Feel free to go check it out. Uh, we call it Ronnie for short, uh, just because. Uh, it was funny at the time, I swear. It's still funny. It, I think it's, it's funny. funny. It makes for a good URL. 
Um, here's another view of the same map. The idea here, don't try to read these words, it's impossible. The idea here is to label the capabilities, to enumerate like the, the taxonomy of capabilities that you would put into a platform. And then as a team, you can decide what you've already done, where you want to get to, come up with a plan on how to get there. What do we need to work on next? Right? Don't, get, don't build blue-green deployments if you aren't already checking your code into a code repository. This is a real story. Right? So, uh, so yeah, please check it out, r9y.dev. Uh, we're taking issues. We're taking PRs. Uh, please add yourself. If you have Not a Google a, thing. This is open not a Google source. thing. No, it's open source. If you are like a vendor in the hall, you can add your name to this repository of what your tool does, like what capability do you deliver. Feel free. Um, I think we That's are it. done.